So as a contingent recruiter, you are on the outside. You don't necessarily have a say about the interview process, the speed of the process, the time in which feedback's been given. And when a client doesn't trust you in terms of when when I'm pushing and when I'm needing feedback, often the placement can fall off quite quickly. Um, and I'm sure, as you know, tech needs to move at double the speed. Um, so the, the trust needs to be formed. Welcome to the All-In Recruitment Podcast by Maratao, where we explore best practices, learnings, and trends with leaders in the recruitment space. If you've liked our content so far, please subscribe to our channels on YouTube and Spotify to stay tuned for weekly episodes. I'm your host, Lydia, and with us today is Samantha Lee Hayward, Global Talent Specialist at S. Hayward Consulting, based in Cape Town, South Africa. Thank you for joining us, Samantha. Thank you so much for having me. So, Sam, you have vast experience in the people space. So, walk us through that journey and some of the areas in which you specialize. Certainly. So, like most, I fell into recruitment 17 years ago. And I started as a tech recruiter. So I've only been in the tech industry in an agency. Um, the years following, I founded three recruitment agencies. New Beginnings was the last one. Um, and then closer to COVID, I decided to change the business model and do um, offer more contracting services in-house. So I do contingent recruitment and contracting. Contingent recruitment and contracting for tech specifically. For tech, correct, yes, mm -hmm. for tech companies. Majority has been in South Africa, but since COVID, it has expanded internationally. Oh, where, what regions do you cover now? So, uh, globally, if, mm -hmm. if you can hire in your, so obviously, I, I haven't actually worked in Australia. That time zone's quite far off from us. Um, but I do have a few clients in the US, the UK, and Ireland. So Sam, I've all, I understand that you've also created a community on social media for those in the recruitment industry. So what was the aim behind that? The aim is to get everyone to collaborate, network, connect, learn from each other. Um, I, I think we've been one of the few industries that have bounded and, and got onto the same boat. So this is a really good space for us just to share um, and also to share the findings. I mean, as you know, the AI tech is moving at a rapid rate. Absolutely. We're going to need a community to stay on board. How many people do you have in that network right now? We, we have almost 800 people on our Facebook group. LinkedIn's growing a little bit slower. Um, but yeah, it, it, it grows steadily every month, which is wonderful. Your focus on contingency recruitment, what goes into being a successful contingent recruiter? Nerves of steel, for sure. I think it must be one of the, the only jobs, and I know this is a very old saying in recruitment, where the sales, your sales product can decide at any moment it's not for sale. Um, but in all seriousness, the most important thing that I foresee is certainly relationships. Mm. Majority of the clients that I have have been my clients at least for the last 10 years um, and candidates as well. So it, it, it does take time to build a, a steady contingency uh, model. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it can definitely be done still. So it's 10 years that you've taken to build uh, relationships and also build that trust, right? So it's definitely, as you said, relationships is is the key to succeeding in this place, you know, apart from skills and technology, etc. So how how do you build strong relationship with, re relationships with clients that will lead to higher trust and also, you know, as you said, returning business? Yes. Um, my, my previous boss that I worked with, mm -hmm. he always referred it to meaningful relationships. And I think that is the key is with my clients, I know which times are best to contact them. I know they're working hours um, as with candidates. And I think that just puts you in a different stand compared to the agencies that come and go um, and just work with you, you know, as an external influence. I think it's really important to have a partnership yeah. and, and a, a, a more personable relationship. So in, 
in scenarios in which you know there is a distance like your client is very much you know it's a lot further than you maybe in a different time zone or in a different setting altogether cultural bridges and all those things how do you go about building a relationship with clients to be authentic it's quite a big thing for me um and from the start in when you meeting just to be honest of who you are when you taking down the wreck if you can find the person, if you know how to find the person, is just always be completely authentic and transparent about it. And I find that relationships are built quicker in that manner. And then we're obviously doing tons of Google team face-to-face conversations. Not quite like having a coffee in person, but it is certainly the best next thing. So let's talk about tech recruitment. You've been in this space for a while now, Sam. So what does a recruiter need to know or what do they need to do to solidify their expertise in, in contingent recruitment for tech? I, I believe the tech industry is vastly different to the other industries. And I, and I say that with experience when I'm hiring for finance roles and then I cross back over to tech. And I think it's really important to understand the caliber of people that we're dealing with. Yeah. And um, I, I certainly don't want to generalize, but there are ways in which engineers want to be interviewed and how they want to communicate. Um, it's also really important to understand the basics of tech. So we'll never, I'll never be able to keep up with the ins and outs of technology, but I do know what tech stack is in the front end, what tech stack is in the back end. Um, and, you know, what tech is extremely hard to come by. So I can level out with the clients and tell them it's not going to take me a week to hire. And also understanding which companies work with which technologies. So I do a lot of headhunting. Um, and to know which companies to target is hugely helpful, saving you a lot of time not to do that research, you know, after you've received the job description. How long did it take to reach that level? How much research did it involve? <laughs> Over 10 years. Yeah. And, and it's also not something that can be forced. Mm. Um, it, it's as you gain experience, so it gets easier. And I think with mo- most things in life, the older you get, the easier it gets. So what are some common challenges? <clears throat> Sorry, I'll do this again. What are some common challenges in contingent recruitment and how do you overcome them? I, I think the biggest would be onboarding new clients and creating that trust. So as a contingent recruiter, you are on the outside. You don't necessarily have a say about the interview process, the speed of the process, the time in which feedback's been given. And when a client doesn't trust you in terms of when when I'm pushing and when I'm needing feedback, often the placement can fall off quite quickly. Um, and I'm sure, as you know, tech needs to move at double the speed. Um, so the, the trust needs to be formed and the client really does need to follow our lead because the candidate is, you know, they, they're taking charge these days. And how does that compare with your experience as a contract recruiter going into a company and, and being with them for a spe- specified amount of time? It's certainly easier. Um, I, I think when you invested, let's say, six months into a company, so the client has brought you on board for a purpose. They know that things need to improve. They know that they've taken on somebody who specialized in their area and they're open and willing, you know, to receive feedback. Mm-hmm. Whereas contingent companies aren't necessarily wanting feedback. You know, they might think that their process is perfect. Um, so, so it definitely is easier um, to work with a contract company most of the time. In what ways do you, are you able to advise a company in terms of, you know, hiring processes or their interview process or their feedback in terms of time, et cetera. So in, in what ways are you able to advise a company as an independent recruiter in-house as opposed to being a contingent recruiter? I would say it, it could start from 
what the company offers mm-hmm. and employer branding. Because most of the people that we speak to aren't happy. So we know what they are looking for. So we really are at the core of what candidates are wanting. So we can advise clients, you know, what they should be offering around to the interview process and the speed of which that happens, Mm -hmm. as well as giving feedback on technical assessments. Um, Although that's going to change radically now with AI, which will be very interesting to see. Um, and and even up to the onboarding, you know, I, I think recruitment recruitment doesn't end when the offer is signed. A, a lot of impact is made when the candidate is onboarded at the same time. So from from that entire process, we can definitely give good feedback. Do you have any examples of any successes that you've had in, in recent years? With regards to working in the whole process? Yes, yes. Improving um, processes. I've, Improving the pro- I've I've been extremely fortunate mm-hmm. to work with companies that have had phenomenal head of HR. Um, I have worked at smaller companies where we've we we created uh, or we um, implemented the first ATS mm-hmm. and we started creating the first pipeline. So and that's also key is creating a future of work. So, so there certainly have been some wonderful successes, um, but we'll only really see that in the long term. So an ATS system is just your structure. But what I'd like to see in a year's time is our candidates reaching out to the company directly because of the marketing that was implemented. Um, and can HR, you know, contact candidates that are currently on their database because there should be a, a large um, backlog of candidates that could be contacted. And also speaking of the interview process, you mentioned earlier how certain uh, engineers or they prefer a certain type of interview style or process. So in the competition, as we know, for skilled tech talent is so fierce and that length of the interview process itself can become an area of focus. So some candidates, particularly those in demand, may lose interest if the process is too long or if there's no feedback even being given uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the right time. So what are some factors, Seb, that you think a recruiter should consider when they design an effective interview process? Recruiters should know their clients. So from their culture to technologies to what the future is going to look like for the candidates. And when they're doing their screening interview, we can eliminate at least two rounds of interviews for the company. So the HR wouldn't have to interview, maybe the line manager, not either, because we can assess the culture and very basic technology fits. Then the second round of interview could be the tech assessment and then your final interview. Um, so a recruiter certainly can take time off. Um, and as you said, it's really essential that the interview processes do speed up. Speaking of technology, like we did earlier, there are plenty of tools to automate hiring and plenty of them to plenty, plenty of tools available to streamline that process, shorten that process, make it more efficient, and, and eventually bring about a much better candidate experience. So how might technology like an ATS such as ours in Medital help to ensure that your hiring practices or your hiring standards have, have been met? Sure. Um, so I manage, so in the company I'm hire, I'm dealing with several hiring managers. There are times I can see that Tom, who heads the one department, he I make mm-hmm. placements with him after he meets three candidates. But Sarah in another division, she she needs to see six. That's her comfort zone. And then I can see that she can make a decision. So I do very often track the hiring managers, what my cycles have been with them, mm-hmm. how long the placements have taken, what the processes have been. So in future, you know, we're not thrown off by sending one CV and then another and then knowing that they need to see more. So I do keep our stats and our ATS does track that. And then also to know where majority of the candidates have come from. Um, you know, if I'm working with a hardware company, they've got quite a few restraints of trades. Mm. So I, I look back at the history of which companies the candidates have come from, and it saves me a lot of time interviewing candidates mm-hmm. that can't move there as well. Now, that's interesting that you look at the habits of the hiring manager 
it you know themselves and you, you see what their preferences are so you're just so sort of shot in that time that you take to open yes, back and forth, yes. right? Okay. And, and that again just stems back to the relationship yes is, absolutely you know yeah knowing their preference um and you really want to make the hiring manager feel comfortable with their decision as as a contingent recruiter for instance and in being outside the organization do you have more opportunities to meet the hiring manager or do you deal directly with um, the talent acquisition or recruitment team in-house I would say a couple of years ago, um, we would mainly deal with HR and uh, the in-house recruitment team. Mm-hmm. It certainly helps to meet the hiring manager. And as I've aged, I've become a little bit more confident um, and have requested to speak with the hiring manager. And it's not that I want to override anyone's process. And you know, if their process is to deal with the HR and the hiring team, that is what I follow. But often the message is lost in translation from the hiring manager to the hiring team to the contingent recruiter. So it's good to know what the hiring manager really is looking for, to know his personality. Mm. And that way I can also bridge the gap with culture. I know which candidate's going to work well with the hiring manager. What are some ways to bridge these gaps? I mean, you've got the communication going on with HR and you've got communication with the recruiter, you've got communication with a uh, candidate, and then you've got communication with the hiring manager, right? So how, in your experience, how do you bridge these gaps? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, do you know, I, I think it is really just to communicate a lot. Um, no news is news. And in tech, it can take a week, two weeks to find candidates. And I always find for people not to feel uneasy with no communication, I am always in talks with with the people who need me to tell them where I am in the screening process and the interview process and if I don't have any candidates. Most of the hiring managers I normally have on WhatsApp um, and, you know, we'll pop them a little message of an update just to, to ease them. So, you know, so they don't feel unsettled that their recruitment team isn't um, managing the process either. But that, again, depends on the relationship. Yeah, relationship, time and speed and uh, being consistent with the communication and, and being engaging with both your client and your candidate to keep them both, both warm. So that's that's quite a quite a lot to juggle. For, for a continuous yeah. <laughs> recruiter these days, especially when things are going so fast. I mean, how is AI going to going to impact this? How do you think AI would AI would, would benefit or help in in such instances? You know, I, I must be honest, I haven't jumped on the AI wagon. I've I've attended quite a few webinars looking at how AI is going to assist recruiters. And I haven't seen the benefits just yet for myself personally. Um, one, most of the placements that I make is via headhunting. So, and, and it's extremely personable. So I will check my ATS to see if I've met the candidates, if I can have, you know, a reference to the conversation. Um, this is something that AI will never be able to take over is my personal experience with the candidates. Um, and yeah, so I, I just can't see where it can fit in for me because my whole business is based around relationships and soft skills. But I'm open and I'm listening and I'm attending all webinars. I'm waiting for the, the penny to drop. We've rewritten a few job descriptions, um, you know, to try to beef it up a bit. But again, it, it's just, it just doesn't come across as it sounds like it's from me. So. You know, all my posts and everything that I make, I think if somebody had to put that next to AI, they can hear my voice in my one. Um, And I don't want to lose that. Mm. I I don't want to to ever be a generalist, somebody that's just going to sound like everyone else, because I think I'm going to lose then um, my touch for contingent. What advice would you give someone who's starting out in recruitment today? You know, in the era of, AI and, and everything else, all the technology that's happening today. What advice do you give? Again, 
all about meaningful relationships. And in the beginning, now's the time to start. So to really get to know the clients personally from the HR team to the receptionist, although I don't think we have receptionists much these days, we contact everyone on their mobiles, um, to the hiring manager. And if you can't get to the hiring manager, you know, fight your way in there. And also for candidates, you know, I think it's really important to understand when a candidate can talk, when they can't talk, what their bugbears are, um, and for them to trust you is really vital. So yeah, so maybe don't jump on the AI or the tech wagon too much and come back down to having meaningful relationships. Thank you very much for your time, your insights and your generosity with your with your knowledge, Samantha. And I'm sure the audience, whoever is listening in, would want to connect with you. So uh, what what is your preferred channel? LinkedIn, for sure. I'm as a, as any other recruiter, we're on there twenty four seven. Thank you so much, Samantha. And we have been in conversation with Samantha Lee Hayward, Global Talent Specialist at S Hayward Consulting in South Africa. Thank you for joining us this week. Remember to subscribe to our channels to stay tuned for more insights from all of the crew.